1990, the president of South Africa, F.W. de Klerk, released Nelson Mandela from prison. He unbanned liberation movements and freed opposition parties. In doing so, he paved the way for the negotiated peace settlement that came between the apartheid regime and those who fought against it. But one of the big problems uh, for negotiations was that they had to do something about accountability. And some people had committed atrocities. Some people had suffered greatly at the hands of them and at the hands of security forces, at the hands of gangs and some of the liberation movements. How was South Africa going to deal with both abusers and victims? And the security forces at the time uh, were a bit of a threat to the stability and the movement forward with this process. And they demanded that amnesty be written into the constitution. And without it, the regime probably wouldn't have ceded over power. But uh, they did. But what to do about accountability? Under Mandela, under his presidency a little later, a way forward was established. And uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Committee Commission was set up uh, to promote national unity and reconciliation. And uh, you re may remember Desmond Tutu, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, was the head of the commission, and it investigated all sorts of human rights abuses, and it allowed uh, victims to tell their stories, uh, and uh, it granted amnesty to those who had perpetrated a lot of crimes if they would come forward and tell the stories tell the truth, and ask for forgiveness. And they managed to form this harrowing account at times of what went on, especially between 1960 and 1994. And uh, they, they received about 7,000 uh, requests for amnesty from individuals. They had 2,500 hearings to deal with those amnesties, and they granted 1,500 and amnesties. Now there were limitations to the process, however. There were some in the government, the higher echelons of the government, the higher echelons of the military who stayed away, and what happened was it was essentially the foot soldiers of all these movements that bore the collective shame for what, was, what had gone on. But yet this process and the public nature of it brought some healing to South Africa, and South Africa was able to move forward. Of course, it's not perfect there, but they've been able to move forward in ways that other nations, perhaps like Zimbabwe, uh, have not as they've moved beyond colonial rule. Truth and reconciliation. One of those words, reconciliation, appears in the passage that Garnet read for us today and um, it's part of the gospel and part of Paul's second Corinthians where he exhorts us, if you picked it up, be reconciled to God. It's a great theme for Lent. And the backdrop of Paul's remarks, or if you can visualize something, it would be peppered with human sinfulness, with associated separation from God and then the grace of God that Paul himself had experienced in Jesus Christ. And Paul's thought about this was not only steeped in his experience, but in Scripture and uh, in the ancient word. He, he could well be thinking of Isaiah's words to us where Isaiah issues this warning. Your iniquities have been barriers between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you. And then Isaiah's foresight 
Arise, shine. Sometimes we, we read that during Christmas or Epiphany. Arise, shine. Your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And generations later than Isaiah, Paul sees the same issues around amongst the people and looking at the same human condition, but he's also looking at the work of Jesus Christ that can bring light and amnesty and renewal to people. So if anyone is in Christ, he says, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. And all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. Now, that backdrop I was mentioning with, with sin and separation and, and then grace. When we hear some of that backdrop, some of us will say, but this is the 21st century. This is Canada. We don't have these problems. We're not that bad. We don't have human rights abuses here, for instance. Or, or do we? Maybe another truth and reconciliation process would beg to differ. But we would say that's not widespread. That's not widespread. We don't have murders and abductions and killings and that sort of thing. And maybe our newscasts would point us in a different direction sometimes. Yeah, but we're not really that bad. We, we're not like South Africa. We have sunny ways. Or have we? I wonder what Jody Wilson Raybo would say about sunny ways right now. But come on, come on, we're not that bad. We're united church people. We're steeped in the social gospel. We do things like help others as much as we can. We champion human rights. We don't go around abusing others. Mm, yeah, but... I don't know about you, but maybe sometimes I slip or you slip. And maybe it's in our relationships or maybe in our financial dealings or maybe when we get angry or... Maybe we're not that bad compared to some, but the true test of our goodness is not how we align with the character of others, but how we align with the character of God. Can we truly say that we align with the character of God? Maybe sometimes we goof up, and that causes this separation that, that, that Isaiah spoke of. And we need reconciliation. That, that Paul tells us about. Well, if you think about reconciliation, reconciliation af- takes a couple of forms uh, in the world. After um, the Second World War, the Nuremberg trials, reconciliation there involved people uh, receiving the death penalty, people being, uh, having life imprisonment as, as a punishment, Reconciliation in South Africa, however, was very different. Um, It took the form of this truth and reconciliation process, and amnesty was possible. Granted, even for serious crimes, if individuals were were honest about what happened and would verbalize it and would ask for forgiveness. Bishop Desmond Tutu, he wrote this, for our nation to heal and become a more humane place, We had to embrace our enemies as well as our friends. And he pointed out that true reconciliation can only occur when events are properly confronted. And he says this, after a husband and wife or two friends have quarreled, and I know you don't do that, nobody does that, but but he sees it sometimes. After a husband and wife or two friends have quarreled, 
if they merely gloss over their differences or metaphorically paper over the cracks, they must not be surprised when they are soon at it again, and perhaps more violently than before, because they have tried to heal their ailment lightly. True reconciliation, says Tutu, is based on knowing what has happened, true confession and contrition, and forgiveness. Someone has to be willing to truly confess, and someone else has to be willing to truly give forgiveness if there's to be a future in the relationship. And he thinks this is true between parents and children, between siblings, between neighbors, between friends. Equally, confession, forgiveness, and reconciliation in the lives of nations are not just airy-fairy religious and spiritual things, nebulous and unrealistic. They're the stuff of practical politics. And he went on to reflect in this article that he wrote about that old adage uh, that those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. And he knew in South Africa, if they just had a blanket amnesty along the lines of, of saying, well, let's just let bygones be bygones and get on with it, that it would be shallow. How can you forgive, he said, if you don't know what or whom to forgive? And uh, he's determined to, to deal with the past and all its horror. And the commission ha had these hearings, and it uh, required full disclosure before giving amnesty. And uh, only with full disclosure, he thought, would you get what happened out there. And in the process of requesting and receiving forgiveness, only through these things would it be transformative for the nation, and the people of South Africa. And that was radical. It was very radical for Tutu. He said, we have to get to the root of things. Remove that which is festering. Cleanse it. Cauterize it. And only then is a new beginning possible. Switch gears for just a moment. Last uh, Sunday, uh, my mother, or Monday, my mother had a birthday and my sister and brother-in-law hosted uh, a little party, and they decked the place out with all kinds of goodies, and there were balloons all over the place. And my 12-year-old niece, Sarah, took one of the balloons, and it was filled with confetti. And um, she was playing with the balloon, and, and she was uh, playing sort of a keepy uppy game, which is familiar to the football players, soccer players, keeping it up and having a great time. And then she started bouncing it against a counter like this. And um, I had this metal utensil in my hand, which wasn't sharp, by the way. It was very dull, uh, but I just kept inching it towards where she was, <laughs> where she was, you know, banging this balloon. And eventually it got over far enough, and it was hitting the end of the counter and the utensil. And you can imagine what happened. <laughs> Bang! The balloon! First, now that wasn't bad, but you have to realize my sister is completely, I can't use that word, completely um, crazy about cleanliness in her kitchen. And, um, and the confetti goes everywhere. And my first thought is, Sarah, and I said it just like that. And she looked at me and she said, no, you did it. And I said, no, you did it. And she said, no, you did it. And I said, no, you did it. And my sister came over and handed us both a broom and a, and a, a little uh, dustpan. You know, just like Adam and Eve, if you read that story, that's an example of how pretty quickly we can move to shifting blame. You did it! No, you did it! It's a fun example, but it's not surprising, though, when you find it going on in a situation like that, that when it comes to real issues, we're kind of reluctant to take responsibility and to say we're sorry and to take blame. And Desmond Tuzu says, Reconciliation 
isn't about pretending that things are other than they are. It's not about patting each other on the back and, and turning a blind eye. Reconciliation, if it's true, if it's going to do something, exposes things, whatever it is, the awfulness, the abuse, the uh, pain, the hurt, the truth. It's risky, uh, but only an honest confrontation with things can bring real healing and make people whole. It's amazing how much the South African process of truth and reconciliation parallels the gospel and what the gospel asks us to do in our relationship with God. And it calls us, and especially during Lent, to face the reality of ourselves compared with the character of God, not anybody else. And the whole thing is not just saying to God, well, let's make, let bygones be bygones, but, but let's engage things and search out what is yeah, deep in our hearts and where there is darkness to bring those things before God and to confess, to be sorry, to learn and to change directions, to move in a different direction. God wants us to truly engage things so that we can really change directions and move out of the darkness and into light. And he has given us Jesus to show us the way. And then Jesus took the sin upon himself. And from that, we get amnesty and fresh beginnings. And that's the main thrust of Lent as we continue to move to the cross. And we hear this exhortation from our text today. Be reconciled to God. Be honest with God. As honest as the people had to be in South Africa in their process. And then look to God for the grace that comes in Christ. And the amnesty. And the new life. Let us pray. Lord, we hear your text today. We have a concrete example that is very like what you are calling us to. A concrete example in the land of South Africa. And we've learned a little bit about what they went through. We pray that it would help us to engage our own lives and our own experiences, and our own hurts, and the things that we do. Lord, like the butterfly in the children's moment, you want us to be the best selves that we can be. You want us to be beautiful. And you've given us a way in Jesus Christ. And we pray, O oh God, that during this season, as we continue and as we move with Jesus toward the cross, we would hear your word. Amen.